first up, uh, Sean, you're first. Do you have a question? Yes. So I was wondering um, what we can look for in ourselves to better understand our own thoughts and emotions, as well as what we can look for in others or friends we have who might be experiencing some struggles in this time. That's a great question, Sean. Thank you for asking that. Um, super important. So I think that brings me back to sort of thinking about that iceberg analogy that I talked about early in the presentation, where we have to be patient with ourselves, right? So um, when we're feeling anxious or we're feeling stressed, sometimes, and I know you guys are all conditioned right now to push through, to keep going, to get through it, get to the finish line. Um, and because of that, you don't always stop to think about what's stressing you out and that's hard. So that's why I really push like journaling in some way or keeping a notes app where you can just kind of write down some of the things that you're feeling. But also when you see that your peers are struggling, the best thing you can do is just say in your own teen lingo that makes sense to you, but hey, what's up? How can I help? Can I listen? Like run it by me, run something by me. I'm gonna help you through this. Like I'm here. Um, and I know that I'm not talking like a teenager right now, but you know the words to use with your friends. Um, and also being able to ask for that. So when you're feeling dysregulated, when you're having those symptoms of like, I don't know, I just don't feel right. You know, maybe you don't have stomach aches or headaches, but you, you know when you don't feel right, right? So when you start to feel that way, being able to say to one of your close friends, like, I don't know what's up, but I just feel weird. Like, do you feel weird? You know, connect with other people because I find that when teenagers start doing that and, and throw that ball to their friend, then others open up and there's more of a back and forth and it kind of breaks down that stigma and it gives you the opportunity to talk, especially boys, because girls are socialized to, you know, talk, 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 and boys really are not. Boys are socialized to get through stuff, be strong, you know, don't worry about it. You'll overcome it. Um, I just think that's awful messaging. And I think that you can be a change maker by being willing to talk to your friends and being there to empathize with them when you see that they're struggling. Thank you. That's great, really helpful. Haley, you are up next. Hi, so my name is Haley Noll. I'm a junior at Glenmar North High School. And my question is, how are we as students supposed to know when to give ourselves grace or when we are supposed to push past challenges that we are faced with? Oh, wow, that's a great question, Haley. So first of all, I wanna say right now, you need to create a wide berth of grace because you've been through a lot and you're still going through a lot. And I think you are one of the students who's heading into exams, not really having taken many exams. I was talking to one of your teachers earlier. Um, and so you have to be okay with things being medium or just okay, right? You have to cut yourself some slack if these exams don't go as well as you hope or anticipate, even though I know you're having that future thinking that you can't really get away from because you do have the future coming down the way for you. Um, I think right now we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to push through things. And the message I would like to get to students is that you, you can get through it together. So I talked about that study that came out that, that the LA Times reported on about the importance of peer support. And I don't know what, I know your, your school is doing some stuff for exam prep, but, and maybe this is an angle that you can take to help yourself and your peers or Sean, who just asked a similar question. But what we find over and over again is that when there are peer support networks in place at schools um, where kids can just go and hang out and talk, or they can talk to somebody one-to-one, -one, it actually really works um, where they feel like they can get through hard things together instead of just trying to push through and trying to overcome obstacles all the time because you've been overcoming obstacles. Like every time you turn around, we throw three more at you right now and nobody wants to. That's just the way things are going right now for you guys and it's really awful and all the adults feel horrible about it even if they don't always say that. Um, so what you can do is instead of trying to push through, work through together. So, you know, find your friends that you can trust. If you feel like you can create something at school or get a teacher to sponsor creating something at school, I would encourage you to do that so that you guys have safe places to go or brave spaces to go and talk about all this stuff together. And that's what's going to help you overcome. It's not just pushing yourself. It's having support in place to get through the hard stuff. Thank you. Nathan, this is our last student question. You're next. Yep. 
Uh, so uh, I know like me and my friends are having trouble like transitioning back to like um, our in school schedules and like normality. Um, and you know we like can't ima- we could like before we couldn't imagine that it'd be like this difficult to try to adjust back. Uh, and so like my question was like um, what suggestions do you have for us now that we've like uh, are adjusting to return back to our in school schedules and back to what we normally do. Nathan, I am having trouble adjusting back to normality as well. So you you guys are not alone. I think um, adults have a fun way of trying to pretend they're doing everything great when really we're totally dysregulated and having the same problems. So you guys are not alone. And I am hearing this from teenagers coast to coast. Like, this is too hard, you know? And I know everybody kind of wanted to go back because being at home was terrible. Um, but now being back full time is really, really hard. So that kind of goes back to figuring out the self care or, you know, self compassion that works for you. And I always, am, I tread carefully around the technology stuff because I say to parents all the time, this is where you guys connect outside of school. And I know that. So it's important. We don't want to, you know, take that stuff away, but just kind of finding balance and finding what works for you, um, because it's hard, it's hard to go to, it's exhausting. I feel like you're probably really tired at the end of every single day and then you have to do homework and it's brutal. Um, So back to Haley's question of, you know, have grace for yourself. You know, if you're not getting it all done or you're phoning it in a little bit of the time, um, don't beat yourself up, you're doing your best. All you can do is try. I am finding that teachers are especially helpful if you email them privately and say, hey, I'm struggling. I, I'm trying to get all my work done. I really am. I'm doing my best, but I'm finding that it's really, really hard. Um, teachers are trying to work with students to help them over this hump. But I would say connect socially as much as you can because you need that right now. Get your sleep. I know you don't want to hear that. Get your sleep. <laughs> get, make sure you're getting outside and you get some air on your face because now you're back in a school and you're back on an iPad or a laptop all the time. And really just find the balance that works for you to take care of yourself. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, students. I really appreciate your questions. So you too. um, I know it's nice to hear from them, isn't it, Katie? It is, I love talking to kids. And uh, your heart really goes out to them. It's a tough time. Um, What about teen boys that do not talk at all? Has the symptoms, how do we get them to open up? Yeah, sometimes they don't, <laughs> like, you know, but the what, what we do is we meet them where they are, which I keep using this phrase, but so, you know, I'm going to use my son as an example because he's a 13 year old boy. So perfect teen boy, right? What does he like to do? What gets him excited? What's fun? Okay. Uh, playing Madden, which I stink at by the way, but um, playing Madden on, on the Xbox or playing board games or shooting hoops, um, you know, we know that people are more likely to talk when they're not staring face to face, which is a funny thing for a therapist to say, because, you know, I got a kid on my couch or on the other end of my screen, and we're basically talking face to face. But when it comes to parents and kids, or even, you know, spouses, um, it's easier to talk when you're not staring right at someone, because A, you don't have to see the immediate facial expression, which isn't always great. Not everyone has a good poker face. Um, And B, (laughs) it's less pressure. So doing things, I always suggest just doing things together and stop interviewing them. Somewhere along the line, some expert somewhere told all parents that the minute a teenager gets in the car, you're supposed to ask them like 30 questions. They hate this. They tell me all the time I hate this. So stop interrogating them on the way home. Let them put in their AirPods and listen to music. They are tired. They tried their best. They need a break. Um, And just try to just engage with them and, and just ask regular questions. You know, you're, you don't, they'll come to you when they really need you. It's also okay to just say, hey, what was something funny that happened today? Anything? Like, do you have any good stories of the day? Um, That's how I open most of my therapy sessions. You know, what's the good drama of the day? What's a good story of the day? So, you know, just let them talk about regular stuff because it's really hard to talk about the hard stuff. It'll come naturally after you've been conversing more often. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Katie, what do you think is the, is the 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 one thing that the biggest mistake parents are making now? Um, I, I worried about this from the minute the pandemic hit because the talking point was, oh no, the academic losses are going to be huge. So now that we're back, the pressure is on these kids to get straight A's, 
to make up for all the lost learning, you know, to perform, to be ready to, you know, get into college. Um, even with sports, I mean, I don't know, like I, I've got a kid who plays club baskets, bonkers out there, right? With the pressure on sports, um, on getting points, on scoring goals, on being the top performer. It's really, really a lot. No matter what kids are doing, um, we're expecting them to perform really, really well. Are we performing really, really well, Gilda? Because I'm not sure. Like, I am dog tired at the end of every day. And I'm like, did I at least do marginally okay? Great, I'm gonna sleep and try again tomorrow. So I think we have to really dial back our expectations and create reasonable expectations with our teens. Um, they know how they're feeling. They know more about themselves than we do. And we've got to trust them and listen to them when they're telling us stuff. And we have to kind of, just have reasonable expectations right now that they will slowly get back into it. Grades are not, I, I know it's hard with the college stuff, but one grade does not make or break a kid. It just doesn't. So we have to get our head out of that space. And if we're always reaching, because this is the thing I see right now, we're always reaching for these elite colleges or these programs and stuff. And sometimes we're pushing kids so hard and then they get there and it's not right for them. So I'm always saying like, whether your kid is in middle school or high school and you're thinking about these things, the gift of the United States of America is that we have over 5,000 institutions for them to apply to. And there is a best match out there for them somewhere. And it might be the shiny one you hear about in US News and World Report, and it might not, and it doesn't matter as long as they go and they learn and they find the best match. Right, right, right. This is our last question. How do we normalize? Now, do you see this question as well? Um, how it's this is in the Q and A, um, and maybe you can make better sense of this. How do we normalize going back into the world and doing? Oh, here it is. How do we help kids to work through going out and doing things with family or attending different events after being stuck at home after COVID? Thank you for yeah. the clarification. Okay. Um, well. What I'm mostly saying right now is proceed with caution. <laughs> so, um, you know, like I was saying to Nathan and, and saying at some point in the presentation, we kind of, you know, we hard stopped them for a long, long time. And then we threw them back out and we were like, okay, everything's fine. You're vaccinated. So you can do all the things. It's pretty overwhelming. Um, you know, I even was somewhere with my son for the first time where we were where, around a lot of people in Los Angeles was super locked down for such a long time, but we were in a place where there were all these people and we both went, huh, this is more people than we're comfortable with. Um, so take it slow, kind of take the temperature, talk about it, listen to their concerns. Um, you know, we want to empower kids to be getting back out there and engaging in the world, but also, you know, we all learned a lot about ourselves during this time. And one thing I've heard from a lot of teens is, you know, I think I'm more introverted than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like quiet weekends. And is that okay? Do I have to go back to going to all the parties and doing all the things? And the answer is no. You know, knowing who you are and what works for you and what helps you thrive is really, really important. So, you know, making sure you have that time to rest and recover, I think is really important. That's good information about yourself. So, you know, knowing who you are and knowing what you like is important. Now, sometimes we do have to do family things because that's what we do. That's how we connect as families. Um, and it shouldn't feel like a punishment, but we can plan for it. You know, instead of staying for four hours, we can stay for two or one and a half. You know, we can take two cars if our teens are driving and, and they hit their sort of breaking point, but we want to stay, we can let them go home, right? So we can plan around it so that everybody gets their needs met um while also having grace for one another as we figure out where we go from here well nobody has left us because they're learning so much on <laughs> um you've talked about the empathy the validating i love what you the, what you just said about um you know he helping them discover who they are and what helps them thrive i learned so much from you katie and i'm so grateful that you're here with us at this, this time because we really need to hear from you so thank you so much. Thank you, students. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. Come back. And Katie, we'll see you with the next book, okay? Sounds good. Thanks, Gilda. Have a great evening, everybody. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.